If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, this guy's a, he's an OG, man. Oh, yeah, man. I Vin, like this guy. Vinny Tortorich has been doing this uh, for a long time. He was a celebrity trainer in L.A., Back in the day. Got his start from the Playboy Mansion. I, <laughs> God bless that guy. Great story. Um, the guy's right along lines with us. Looking in terms forward of the, to doing some more stuff with this guy, man. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, I yeah. love this guy. Yeah, yeah. No, great just, vibe, great energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he's one of my people. Um, he's, Killer stories. He's got, yeah, great stories when he's it comes to Italian. fitness. Yeah. He's got a good podcast. It's actually pretty funny, um, kind of our style. It's called Fitness Confidential, so you should check it out. Um, we have some good conversations with him. Um, also... This is like the last week. I think this week is it, right, for the promotion. So our promotion is you get one of our MAPS programs for free if you enroll in any MAPS program or bundle. You either get MAPS Prime for free, you either get MAPS Prime Pro for free, or MAPS Performance for free. It's a pretty big promotion. Sweet deal. That's going on. Uh, You can find that all at mindpumpmedia.com. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Vinny Tortorich, uh, podcast host of Fitness Confidential. So you were you were telling us a story of how uh, you got on. You did your stuff on the internet. You wrote a book, and they said that was a good story. I want to continue. Oh, I that. love that you actually Googled how to become a famous person on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go back a little bit for the audience. But you know, I I, I wrote a book, and I didn't want to write a book. I think everybody goes, "Hey, man, I want to write a book." Or, "Hey, I, you know," because I live in Hollywood, and everybody's got. Um, you know, all, most of my friends are producers, and back in the day, everyone was producing a sitcom. There was like 48 sitcoms on television. You, you guys are a lot younger. You you don't even know what a sitcom is. You, you're watching Netflix and stuff. <laughs> we talked. We had Full House. <laughs> it, it, it was yeah. that. Yeah, it was like 40 something of those. And you know, like literally, I had a friend. She would go to her dentist, and she's got a tooth hurting, and he's in her mouth, and he's going. Hey, I have this great idea for a sitcom. You know, it's, in a, it's set in a dentist office. You know, everybody thought they were getting ready to write something. And I worked with celebrities and hated it, the idea of being on television or in television or any part of television, right? So this is all going on. And we had a writer strike. And my, my good friend, uh, uh, Dean Laurie, who is a writer producer, uh, most famously known for um, uh, Arrested Development and movies like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, My Wife and Kids was one of his TV shows. <laughs> he kept telling me, you have a book in you. you know, and I was like, I don't want to write a book. And he said, but you're sitting around right now because when the industry goes on strike, I go on strike because there's no one to train. When you train celebrities all day and they go on strike. Oh, wow. You're done. That's right. That's right. Because that was your thing. That's what you did. You trained right. celebrities. I just I trained. I got people ready for red carpets and the whole thing, and for TV shows and what have you. And when they stop working, they you're fired that day. They, you walk in the next time and you go, ah, eh, yeah, we won't need you until we go back to work. Oh, it's like that. So were you hired by the production companies then, or by the actual celebrities themselves? Very seldom. Sometimes by them. Sometimes by the management. So in other words. Mm. Two or three different scenarios, and we'll get back to the other story, but mm-hmm. one of the scenarios is we have an actress, and she's got to be in a bikini in this movie, and she's not bikini ready, but we sold this movie based on her star power, but she just had a kid. You got six weeks. That's your job. <laughs> yeah, and they will Clean pay for that. Now, how do you get into that? How oh, the heck? Because that sounds well, like every trainer's dream. He says you got produ- you had producer friends and things Is like that. that. How you got yeah, I, well, I got producer friends after that. Oh, yeah, so oh. that's a very good question because every trainer in the world wants to do that. They right. come to town and they go, "I want to work with celebrities." And the first thing I tell them is, number one, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea what you're They're asking. They're not difficult at all, right? <laughs> well, it's not even about that. People think, oh, they're celebrities. They'll pay 20 times as much. Not true. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other way around. We want everything for free. Getting, Every at pro athlete or celebrity I've well, dealt with well, wants right. stuff well, for free. Well, because as a trainer, I would assume you train a celebrity, it's going to give you clout. So they probably have but that. that, to, that, uh, that but really, it, uh, it does, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't literally put money in your pocket the way every trainer, they you know, oh, I'm going to go to LA and become a celebrity fitness trainer. Good luck with that one. Yeah. yeah. Because everybody left their small town <laughs> with that dream. Yeah. Um, the fact that I 
got that was the luckiest move on the planet. Mm. And I, I wasn't even going after it. It was, I got to town 27 years ago. Uh, nobody would return my phone call. You know, I couldn't get, I couldn't, I would literally, like a, a guy that chops trees, I, I would take a rock and put it with a note in a Ziploc bag and toss it over fences to see if I could get business. You're kidding me. Wow. I'm, not, I'm not making, I was. So I you're was, here in LA and you're like throwing Yeah, I'm like putting people. stuff in people's, you know, mailboxes every day. Style, huh? I love yeah, that. Yeah, because there was, and by the way, no one ever called me from that. But <laughs> I was here for two or three months because I was pretty well known for this back in New Orleans for 10 years before I came out here. So we're talking 1980 to, to 90. I was doing 81 to 91. I was doing this. I come out here and it's like crickets and I don't know anyone. And a friend of mine said, I know someone at uh, Playboy that works in, you know, for Playboy International. So I went and had lunch with her and um, she said, yeah, if I can figure out a way to help you out and the whole thing. When I came back from lunch, I met a woman who worked for Playboy. She was a uh, middle management. She was wider than she was tall. And she had a kid in school and holding, she didn't have a lot of money to spend. I trained her for $25 per time, four days a week, got her eating right, and within a year, I took 165, 180 pounds off of this woman. She wow. looked like a different human being. Wow. And everyone at Playboy took note. It, it, you couldn't have... You couldn't have done better. Oh, that's better. the best advertising. Yeah, yeah that's right. that's like a billboard on Sunset. Right. Mm-hmm. That's like... And yeah. she worked in a place, I mean, surrounded by people probably looking for right. trainers or whatever. And a couple of other um, uh, VPs started using me and the whole thing. And, and that led to Playmates. Because the thing that people don't realize about Playmates is they have a problem. Once they become a Playmate, they're now under contract for two years by Playboy. And um, uh, they have to look a certain way. They have to go to all the Cinco de Mayo's and Vegas weekend and the whole thing. Mm-hmm. They can't be fat. They have to look like Playmates. Right. Don't they Don't they actually measure them? And if they get beyond certain measurements and things like that? I don't that, know they, anything about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I do know that if they want to keep working and making that money, that sideline money from Playboy, they have to look a certain way because yeah. Playboy will just kind of go... Eh, you sit this one out. Hmm. We'll go with you. <laughs> yeah, Adam, you're a lot easier to go with. Uh, you know, Sal over he's, here, his biceps are too big. His boobs are too small. Yeah, yeah he, he doesn't have <laughs> Sal. Yeah. So that, He's natural, though. That's how I started working with a few playmates. And playmates are somewhat hooked to real celebrity, if that makes any sense. Because... Every hot celebrity in town wants, wants a Playboy girl. Come to be on, with a yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So now are they hiring you themselves, like, or is Playboy high hiring you? Uh, interesting. Um, Playboy hired me for some of them. Some of the other girls went. Wait, you're looking great. How do I get this guy? And they would hire me. Fantastic. Out of their own pocket. What a fucking rad job. Yeah. 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 Kidding me? Yeah. It, it was you, like you struck gold, sir. Yeah, I just happened to be standing. And you're there. married? Tell you tell me you weren't married. I was, this, please, please, please tell me you yeah. weren't married when this happened. I mean, we don't have was, to go through war stories. I was but. not married. Oh, oh yes. yes. <laughs> and God bless you. <laughs> and by the way, I started getting invited to the mansion, and invited. To, it was like I, I was telling. I was. I was on. I, I do Adam Carolla show. We were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. It's like. Yeah, I remember the first time I messed alone. He goes, because they know I know a lot of celebrities, but I never just throw. He goes, where did you meet? Because he was bragging about meeting Stallone. I went, yeah, I remember the first time. He goes, uh, where did you meet him? I went, I don't know, but it was him and Mick Jagger. And, the, and they're like <laughs> sitting there mind blown. Yeah. It's like, you just mentioned Mick, you know, you just, it's like, yeah, you're in that world. Right. Yeah. And these guys are getting world. these women, right? <clears throat> And I'm not saying Stallone was getting those women or anything else. I'm just saying that these women mingle in that world. Right. And at the time, the Brat Pack was a big thing. You know, remember, you know, St. Almost Fire. And all oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. And I started getting hired by some of those people. And before you know it, uh, and I talk about this in the book, the book that we started this conversation mm-hmm. on. Um, uh, <laughs> I got called in by this big, 
management agency and I'm on this in this building on Sunset and they're saying to me um, and there's a, it's a, a desk it's a table like this and there's a guy sitting at the head of the table and there's a couple of guys a couple of suits from Disney and there's a couple of managers over here and I went into this meeting I was dressed in cargo shorts flip flops and a torn t-shirt and I'm not even sure how I got there you know I was just told to go to this meeting that it would be good. And they're sitting there. I'm sitting right about where Justin's sitting right there. And there's some guy speaks up and goes, um, we understand that you're the go-to guy to get weight off of people in L.A. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll <laughs> yeah, take that's it. Me. Yeah, that's me. That, yeah, yeah, that's what they call me, the, the quick <laughs> weight guy lost. The, the, the weight fixer. Yeah. And they said, we, uh, we need to get some weight off of an actress. And I'm like... Okay. And uh, they said she weighs a certain amount of weight and the whole thing. And we need to get, you know, 40 pounds off of her pretty quickly. And I said, how much time do I have? And they said, six weeks. Oh, geez. So I put my hands on the table and I got up and I go, where are you going? I went, I can't do that. Nobody can do that. What are you talking about? And they said, and while I'm doing that, the guy at the, the guy in the big leather chair at the head of the table writes down a number on a piece of paper. How much is he going to pay you? Bends it, slides it across to me. I open it up and I went, six weeks? <laughs> Let's reevaluate this. Yeah. I'll saw her fucking leg off for that. Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding? I'm going to tie her to my car and she's just going to run oh wherever I go. She's going to be running. And that, I, I got that client. I took the weight off of her. They literally called me back in at six weeks and said, we have a problem. Problem. I took. They said she failed her her test again. Her screen test. Her face is too round. And I literally said, and this is all written in my book, Fitness Confidential. I said, face is too round. You realize she's Korean, right? And they literally around the room, all of these suits went. Uh, we just want it known that we didn't say this. These are the oh, words of Mr. Tortorich. I mean, are we really doing that? <laughs> She's Korean. She's round. She's, <laughs> and literally they were doing that game back in the early 90s. And I went, you got to be kidding me. Wow. And they said, we need you to get more weight. So I took more weight off of her. The, the client was Margaret Cho. I don't know if you guys know. Oh, I know. She was a comedian. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember I, when she lost a lot of weight too. And so this ends a very long story of how you become a celebrity trainer. Mm -hmm. At that point, Margaret is now, her show, you know, All-American Girl is coming out, big sitcom. First time a, an Asian is leading a sitcom, and this is, you know, history. And she's on Arsenio, she's on Letterman, she's on Leno, she's everywhere. And the name on her lips, Vinnie Tortorich. I lost, how did you lose? 55, 60 pounds. Vinnie Tortorich. That Vinnie, was it. Wow. Now, the next day, Every agent in town is going, get Vinnie Tortorich in here tomorrow. I had nothing to do with any of it other than getting a fat lady thin at Playboy and then getting a heavy comedian thin for a sitcom. Wow. Now, if you ask me how to go get, become, <laughs> I don't know. I got lucky. I walked into Playboy one well, day. Well, something, something why, okay, so... I had listened to some of your podcast episodes like over a year ago and why I had my assistant reach out and get to you is because there's not a lot of people that are doing fitness podcasts like us that have a similar message and that is that you call the bullshit out, which is right. what, what we do. And there's not a lot of us that I that I feel talk about this. When did that start? Was this something that you started to put together? Because we share on the show, we've got you know 16 years, 15 years, 20 years in the industry. And I'll be the first to admit that the first 10, I was a terrible, I was probably terrible. Didn't right. know, you know, I was getting fed all the bullshit. I was regurgitating the information that I'm giving that are pushed by supplement companies and bias studies. And that was what I was delivering down to my clients. It wasn't until later that I really start to put it together. At what point did you really put that together for you? Like, was that early on in your career or that happened over time? I'm 55 this month. I walked into a gym when I was eight. 1970. Gyms didn't exist the way they exist today. Of course, there's no Google. There's no online. So bro science was at a minimum. Um, 
literally people would say, oh, take desiccated liver pills in 1970. That, that was the that number was, one supplement back then. That I mean, was what you took. That's it. Extra protein. But everybody else was eating eggs. Some were eating raw eggs. Some would tell you to eat liver around the clock. Um, you know, you wanted more iron. You wanted more protein, more fat in you. And then in the 70s, I start, you know, because I, I stayed in it. I never got out of it. I walked into a gym as a gym rat. And I had a guy who mentored me all those years. And, you know, at one time, I was 235 pounds with the same amount of body fat I have right now. Oh, wow. You know, I was, I was bigger than this guy. It's hard to believe you could go from that <laughs> to this, yeah. but I did. Um, so I've seen it all. I've done it all. I've been a 400-pound bencher. I've, I've been able to squ- – as a matter of fact, they would call the gym in my hometown and ask if I was squatting that day because that meant – Nobody else was coming in to do bench press. I was using most of the plates. So on leg day, I'm they using would all the weights. Yeah, yeah, it's a small town, small gym. I helped build the gym. So if I and I was going off to play college football, so if Vinny was squatting that day, nobody else came in to do bench press or anything else because we we had three Olympic bars, but we didn't have enough weights to go around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, so I've seen it all come and go. Yeah, And when all the BS supplements started coming in, because I have a degree in physical education and exercise physiology and nutrition, I come from a science background. I went to Tulane and I, you know, I studied. <laughs> you know, whenever people say, hey, man, I take the stuff, because before it was bros, man. Hey, man, you got to take the stuff. It's gonna... I would go, you have a bl- double blind study on that? A- anything? You got anything? And whenever people wouldn't listen to that, I would then go to this. I would say, okay, is it legal in the Olympic competition? And they would say, yes. I would go, okay, it doesn't work. Because anything that works is not legal <laughs> in the Olympic point. competition. <laughs> That's a good point. Very, very true. You know, That's they a good point. Cut, you yeah. could test positive for, uh, for Sudafed and you'll get kicked out. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And you could buy that over the counter. There's a lot of over the counter. Coffee, if you have too much coffee in oh, your system, you, yeah. You know, that's, that's an ergogenic. Coffee actually works better than a lot of the stuff you get that's, from these supplements. So you've so. seen, you've seen uh, the fitness industry being in the gyms, because I was in the gyms in the, in the late 90s. That's when I got on. And I, I've seen a lot of change since then. Right. But you were in there a lot sooner. So you saw the, you saw the transformation from it was just men lifting weights to then women started moving in there to the changes in the diets. I mean... Yeah, you know, at first it was only men. As a matter of fact, I remember when women's, every now and then there would be one chick. And if a chick even had just a little bow on her hamstrings, it was like awesome. It was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, oh, she's hot. You know, you never saw women with muscles or, you know, or even in good shape, women looked like women. Hmm. They were lean, but they looked like women. Right, right. the skinny model type is what they were. Right, right, Twiggy or, you know, this kind of thing, or Cheryl Teagues and all this, you know, but, you didn't see, and, and then Rachel McLeish comes on the scene. Mm-hmm. You know, and she was the first Mister Olymp- Miss Olympia, right? Yes, she yeah. was, and she was hot. And uh, she you could, know, I don't, she couldn't even win a bikini contest nowadays. The, the <laughs> amount of muscle she was not that. I mean, she was right. She was definitely toned, and she, she wouldn't even win. Yeah, the fit model competition, she could not win, but she was gorgeous, and her symmetry was just amazing. And then. You know, you had people like Corey Everson who took it to a little different level at some point in the women's category. Um, but then when the Carla Dunlops and all that came oh, yeah. in, they started looking like men and they started winning. So the women started taking more and more hormones, you know, and weren't you impressed that I even know some of this stuff? Yeah. Oh, no, that's great. I'm a big follower <laughs> right, of the sport. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I, I've always kept my eye on it because I've always loved it and I watched where it went, where guys are in injecting all this stuff to make muscles look like muscles that weren't there and all this stuff. And why does the whole steroid thing go from taking Diana ball to, you know, stacking 30 different things, right. you know, it all changed oh. over time, you know, and, and, uh, I, I, I worry about it sometimes. I worry what it teaches the younger culture of the bro science kids yeah. mm-hmm. who, who are coming up in that. Yeah, you see, uh, I, you know, I remember reading some article with an interview of an old school bodybuilder in, in, in the seventies, sixties and seventies. Like, you know, t- five ten milligrams of Dianabol a day. That was a dose. That's what they took. Yeah. And uh, you know, bodybuilders uh, now are taking grams, 
grams yeah. every, you know, not milligrams, but grams every single week. It's crazy how much has changed. Oh, I uh, found that then. when I went into, I competed and I went, started off, and the whole purpose for me competing, I had no desire. I didn't follow the the industry as far as the bodybuilding industry. Um, but I did see that this was who's on the cover of the magazines. This is who everybody's looking to for advice. And I thought it didn't matter if I knew more than all these people. If I didn't get my name out there, then I, no one was going to listen to what I had to say. So I went on a journey about three and a half, four years ago of getting in shape. And at that time, I'd actually kind of fallen out of shape. I was 19% body fat. And I took myself all the way into down to 7% body fat. And I started doing that to build like a social media presence to build a business. Right. And I saw the traction that I got and I thought, okay, well, I'll take it to the next level. I'll show you guys that I can go from being this average Joe kind of fit guy. And now I'm going to get in shredded shape. Now I'm going to go compete. And I went and competed at the amateur level. And I'll never forget that day standing backstage and, you know, just totally being like a lost puppy dog. I had no, I did it all by myself. I had no coach, no team. And I'm standing around and I'm looking at all these super shredded guys and I'm talking to them and I'm listening to uh, how they got ready for this show and the information that their coach was telling them, the way they were eating, the way they were training. And I thought like, what the fuck are these guys doing? Like, no, it doesn't have to be that crazy. It doesn't have to be that hard. You don't have to take that much drugs to look like this. I'm in men's physique. I'm not even bodybuilding. I mean, we're just right. men's health look. Like, you right. don't need to be taking grams of testosterone to look like that. And I'm listening to that. Well, maybe because this is the amateur level and these guys don't really understand, but the pros got to know their shit. Well, long story short, I worked my way up to the professional level. And the same thing, I get back there, I've got all these pros back here. Now, now my peers, all my buddies are the cover of a magazine guy. And everybody looking up to them and asking them information about nutrition and exercise. And I'm listening to the information they're giving me going, what the fuck are you telling people? Like, this is terrible advice. Like, this right. is, this is going to set these people up for long-term bad relationships with exercise and food. You have no idea. What the, and it's an epidemic actually right now. And it's getting worse. I don't know how many uh, men's physique guys that are 145 to 180 pound guys that I found that were taking grams of testosterone a week to try yeah. and obtain this look and telling people the, the bouts of cardio and exercise and the starving and the diuretics that they were taking and the pulling of fruit out of their diet and taking the sodium out for weeks. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So it's, it's bad and I worry because... That sport's growing really fast right now. When they introduced women's bikini and men's physique, it exploded. I mean, I right. watched it in the last 10 years. Every every year, it's doubling. And so it's growing. Every, and it seems that everybody now wants to be a bikini girl or a men's physique guy and you know, so they can post their pictures on Instagram and say, I'm a competitor and an athlete now. And the information that's being passed around and circulated right now in that world is really bad. It's a lot of what inspired the show. So that was kind of what my story was from that side. And I remember getting with these guys. We were all friends before we worked for a company. I said, we got to talk about this because mm -hmm. this is growing. It's, it's just getting worse. And the people that everybody's looking up to, I mean, you talk about people that have a million plus followers and mm -hmm. that are talking to these people and giving information. It's horrible. So it's, it's scary to think where it's at now and where it's potentially going. And I love talking to someone like you who's actually seen the whole – the whole spectrum. I mean, because the, and we talk about this too on the show that some of the advice they were given 20, 30 years ago about right. nutrition is better than the advice that we're giving it's now. It's coming back. Oh, yeah. yeah. A thousand percent. Better. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and the fact that people think that they have to live on chemicals, it, it's a real, real problem. Um, I, I did something in a micro way um, that I, I knew that I could do. I saw one of my nephews, about your guy's age, um, and he, he was kind of a roly-poly guy, not really fit guy, but not out of shape. And he got into pumping iron. And just like most people, when, when your muscles grow, you almost have this shield around you. Know? And people are now taking notice. Oh, my God, you know, you have biceps. And oh, my God, look at your chest. And once a girl tells a, guy, a young guy anything, you're like sitting there going, noted, I will be in the fucking gym <laughs> as soon as I exit this place right now, right? Push-ups now. Yeah, yeah. it's like, I'm going to go to the bathroom and knock out like you know, <laughs> three sets of 20. On this place. And he kept doing more and more bro science stuff. And the only time I see my nephew is on Facebook. So I keep up with my family, right? Mm -hmm. And I noticed that his biceps are now 19 inches, but his gut is out to here and he's getting fatter and fatter. 
So his brother, his younger brother was coming up for high school graduation. I said, I told him, I said, uh, they all live in Louisiana. I said, I'm going to take you guys up Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in the contiguous United States. And you guys have to train for this. And the bro science guy literally took note and he started hitting the, the uh, stair machine and the whole thing. He told me he knocked 20 pounds off in a couple of months getting ready for this thing, right? His younger brother, ah, I've played basketball this year. I'm graduating high school. I'm good. He didn't do anything, <clears throat> right? So I meet these guys. They come to LA. This nephew, the older guy, the one that's all pumped up, he's pulling out powders and potions. To get ready for this. <laughs> I'm like, man, what is this? This is beet juice, man. It's powdered beet juice, man. There's nitrates in there, bro. And I, you know, <laughs> yeah, nice, what's that? Bro. Oh, that's, yeah. uh, you know, glutamine, bro. Citrine, that's got to feed my. I got to yeah. feed my liver. To feed, I got to get my insulin up to feed. And it, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, but I'm not saying anything. In my mind, I'm going crazy over this. I'm like, oh my god. We get out. We go to Mammoth for a couple of days before we go to Whitney. And I have my buddy from New York who climbs all the time, but my buddy's my age. He's a little heavy. You know, he's an overweight guy, but boy, can he climb. You know, he trains all year. He just eats a lot of pasta, right? So we get out to Mammoth, and they notice that my buddy Don is just running up the hills. And the bro science guy, he can't go a city block without grabbing a knee. (laughs) He literally can't get out of town. It's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. He ended up going six miles up Mount Whitney three days later and turning around. His younger brother only went two and a half miles up, turned around and went home. And driving back to L.A., he started asking me about clean eating. How do I, how do I get off of this shit? Mm-hmm. How do I? Do? And all I could think the whole time was mission accomplished. Right. You I, made you know, your point. Yeah, that's all I had to do. And, mm-hmm. you know, he was looking at a fat guy who summoned it that day, my buddy Don. Yeah. And he's going, I'm taking every product on the planet to the tune of like several hundred dollars a month or more. Right. Right. And he goes, I can't even keep up with an old dude that's fat. (laughs) So he's lost. And the irony of all this is that a lot of these products actually reduce your performance. You know, branched amino acids, when you take them too high, will actually have a depressive effect on the body, make you feel feel tired. Some of the, one of the most mind-blowing things to me was, Years ago, up until well, up until maybe you know, four or five years ago, I ate you know six, seven small meals a day. I ate all the protein. I did everything I was supposed to. Then I learned about fasting and some of the health benefits. Read about some you know high level muscular people that were fasting, how great they felt. So I fasted for the first time ever, it, fully expecting to have a terrible workout, to have low energy, to feel horrible. No supplements, nothing. I had one of the best workouts I had in a long time, and I felt incredible energy, and it was because I was fasting because I didn't have all this food in me all the time. Not to say that you should always do that, but my point is when you optimize your body naturally or let it do what it, what it, what it can do, you know, the performance is incredible. Well, and, look, at, look at things like the pre-workout. You know, That's the, the number one supplement right now that didn't even fucking exist 10 years ago. No. Yeah. The whole it's the number of one supplement sold. Yeah. Everybody's taking it right. because they think it's going to do some shit for them. Yeah. Yeah. But yet, that 10 years ago, that didn't exist. I'm like, that's what I, I always... Yeah, do. Arnold didn't take it pre-workout. Right, I'm like... Exactly, it I'm didn't like, exist. Right, I'm like, think about it. Do you think it's that much of a game changer that it came out out of nowhere in the last 10 years? And when you actually flip the bottle around and you start reading it like that, that feeling you get, that sweat, this... like, I mean, all the chemicals that they put in there to do that, I'm like, go take, go take three or four pills of niacin, sit in your room... And watch, you'll start sweating your dick off. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a B vitamin will make you sweat. It right, will, right. It's a vasodilator. Yeah. yeah. I tell people all the time, what is it? B3 is nice. And I'm, yeah. 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 Take B3 and have a cup of coffee. You're good. Right. Yeah. You're good to go. Right. You, just you don't need anything else. Yeah. 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 Mix up some Hawaiian punch and throw it in there. Now you got yourself a pre-workout. It, it literally, it's sugar <laughs> drinks. Well, yeah. we, sugar we created a bunch of controversy when we first started because so um, our first and main uh, sponsor that we took for the show, uh, we turned down every supplement company that came our way. We wanted nothing to do with it. And it was tough because, and I'm sure you know, yeah. those are normally the sponsors that come when you first yeah. start. Yeah. You know, you start making a little bit of traction and every supplement fucking company wants to pay you some money to rep them and say, this is how you get in shape. And uh, that was against all of our message. So for a long time, we didn't have any sponsors. The only sponsor that we did take on 
was a Chimera Coffee, a coffee company. Yeah. yeah. And we used to tell people that, listen, like if you, I, I, I get why you want to have energy before you go work out. Totally fine. But have a fucking cup of coffee. Yeah. You know, have a cup of coffee. And if a cup of coffee doesn't do it for you and you need two or three, that's probably a sign that you're probably having too much even that. It's probably yeah. time to pull off of it for a while and then cycle back on. So yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's crazy. And uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's getting better or worse. We talk all the time about how you know we're making good traction on the show, and we see these things. I'm like, yeah, but that's in our circle. Sometimes I feel like we're losing this battle because more. Well, and more... then you go to a fitness expo and you see what right. the real right. Vinny, have you been to one oh of those? I, I refuse to go. Uh, I, I've I've been to. I would love past. to. I would love to make you go to one. <laughs> I feel like we should all go. And I, I should just go it. and bring my camera. Yeah. And yes. Yeah. Video because I was at uh, speaking of coffee. I was at a coffee expo. Uh, the big uh, CSAA show up in Seattle because mm-hmm. we're open. We're starting Pure Coffee. I have a vitamin company called Pure Vitamin mm-hmm. Club. Now we're starting Pure Coffee Club, and so I'm up at the big convention and the whole thing, you know, making the rounds. And it's literally football field after football field size arenas of all this stuff. And I pass by, and they got the cute chick out there going, "Hey, you want to try this product? You put it in your coffee. It, it really gives you energy, and it's so good for you." And I went. What is it? And she goes, it's nootropics. And I went, okay. I said, look, I have a meeting right now, but before the weekend's over with, can I come back? And she goes, absolutely. So I told my partner, Andy, I said, keep an eye on her. I want to come back and shoot a little video with her. And it's up on my website. It's up on uh, my YouTube. I go back and I'm asking this girl about what this nootropic, nootropics or whatever it's called. And she's, mm-hmm. it gives you energy and stuff. And I went, Okay, doesn't coffee do that? And it, no, it like is good for your brain and it goes in your brain and is good and stuff. And I just sat there and goofed on her for like five minutes. You know what that, you know what that oh, no. reminds me of is when you go to those, uh, if you go to like political rallies yeah. and you go around and you ask people why they hate yeah, what the they other really person. Believe. Yeah. Tell me why you hate Trump. Yeah, or tell me why you, uh, or he's racist. They, they just blur yeah. out all just the shit. Just ask his GNC you. <laughs> rep, you know, how to describe this product to me. That's yeah. always entertaining. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the whole thing is just crazy uh-huh. when you think about it. Like, let me ask you guys. Let me interview yeah. you guys yeah, yeah. for a second. Sure. Um, I, the, the one I keep getting, and I'm sure you guys are getting, is, "Hey, man, I saw this film. Uh, what the hell? Uh, uh, what the hell? Oh my god! We tore into that actually. We oh, I've tore. Still three, I've done three that. episodes yeah. on it. It's now. crazy that we have to keep yeah. actually revi- revisiting this topic because I thought we did such a good job of destroying it the first time. But you're, you see, you have a million downloads. Yeah, I have a million downloads. Yeah. We're nothing right. compared to right. Netflix right. and what the vegan community does. Well, the format the of document uh, documentary Docum- to, documentaries. Thank you. You're welcome. I was having a hard time with that one. <laughs> <laughs> documentaries. Yeah, is is this format? It's like people really believe because they dress it up so well and they like, dramatize it, and it's become this sort of authority. Uh, just if if you just put it in that format, I feel like people start to like, ooh, they're challenging authority and they're going against the grain. So there's got to be a lot of truth in there, and people like get like really sucked into that. Well, well it's f- it's what the health is. Uh, it's vegan propaganda, right? Now there's some there's some information in there that they're taking that's true. A lot of it isn't. But if you understand, and we we talked about this on our show, if you understand the motives behind that documentary, then it all makes sense. If you take mm-hmm. vegans as a group and you look at the ones that are vegans for long periods of time, the right. ones that tend to stay vegan are vegan for moral reasons, for their own personal moral reasons. Right. They Absolutely. think they think eating animals is as bad as, you know, you know, hurting people or whatever. So for them, by any means necessary, if they can get more if they could save more animals, then that's a good thing. They're, they're saving lives. And, and right. And so this documentary is vegan propaganda. It's and what they're trying to do is they're trying to scare the fuck out of everybody mm-hmm. to stop eating all animal products. It's the first time in my life I've ever heard a health documentary. I'm doing the air quotes. Literally say fish is unhealthy. Yeah. Like they said, fish was unhealthy. And chicken is racist. Ch- oh, no, chicken no. is racist. <laughs> no, it was it was a it was a milk, pig, milk, pork, or milk. No, no, wait, no. <laughs> oh they, my they god! Got, they found the one black vegan doctor. <laughs> Okay. Uh, can you still say black and not be? <laughs> yes, yeah, I don't know. I think you're okay. You're on my book, yeah. raw fitness. So you can they say found the, the first <laughs> African American vegan doctor. I don't think any, I, I have tons of black friends. I can't find one vegan amongst mm-hmm. them. But this guy, he stood there in the film and said, okay, let me explain this to you. Um, 38% Asians, 
uh, can't have dairy. They, they, they uh, lactose, lactose intolerant. Forty-two percent um, of Mexicans can't have dairy. Lactose intolerance. Fifty-two um, percent uh, African Americans can't have milk. They're lactose intolerant. Therefore, by the government putting dairy on the my plate thing, yeah, that's right. that good. is institutional. Racism, <laughs> oh, wow. and that's when I just went. That's how that worked. It out. was. It was the milk. You that's can't the oh fucking be saying that. <laughs> you can't be saying I, that. I loved another one. I loved was if you eat an egg, it's equivalent to five cigarettes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> really? Because let's see, I have four eggs this morning times five. That's twenty. Yeah, twenty. I had a pack. I had a pack of breakfast. <laughs> yeah. I literally had a pack of cigarettes for breakfast. Didn't even realize it. Yeah. You know, and and the, the you know. When you can lie and you have doctor next to your name and you're allowed to lie that way, yeah. it's a problem. So this guy, Kip, with the man bun, right, yeah. <laughs> with, with the monotone that was voice, his name. Yeah. he gets a meeting at the ADA, right? First off, the guy is sitting behind a desk in a suit. Kip, you couldn't even dress up a little bit. <laughs> Get the, the, the stained T-shirt off, something. <laughs> he goes into the ADA He's got a piece of paper with him like this. And he goes, um, uh, Mr. ATA guy, I have a study here that says that uh, if someone eats meat, it's, uh, it'll kill them. It, it'll, meat will kill you. Mr. ADA, why are you killing people? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the guy's like, I don't even know what study you're talking about. <laughs> yes, but you, you, you're killing people. What? Is it okay for you guys to kill people? And the ADA guy is like, sir, I have no idea what study you have in front of you. He goes, would you like to read it? Would you like to read it? Because I have a study. Now, I took it a step further on my podcast. We went to check out what study he was talking about. The study was done by Neil Barnard, one of the guys you saw in the movie, the guy that looked like he could use a meal, that guy. (laughs) He was the guy who did the study. The study is an epidemiological study. It never saw a lab, and it was never (laughs) peer-reviewed. It's worth this piece of paper I have Uh, that's blank right here. The study's (laughs) worth absolutely nothing, but this guy's talking to the ADA with a stained T-shirt going, you're killing people. My favorite was when he he calls in, and he's, he's talking to probably some... 17 year old girl who makes minimum wage and is asking her like all these technical questions and why is the why is the world health uh, organization or they, or they hang up and he's like oh obviously they don't want to yeah. talk to her yeah, yeah. they're avoiding <laughs> yeah, me yeah, yeah. 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 they're avoid- no, they, they figure out you're a kook isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> my other favorite you're an asshole. Like, tell me if you guys you. noticed this one they had four as I like to call them four identified patients in a movie now I can't remember all four one was a woman uh, who they showed walking with a walker She's in a dimly lit room, and they're like, this is Katie. And she's on five medications and walking on a walker, and she gets up really slowly like this, and she's getting up. And then they never, they never tell you what Katie's problem is, <laughs> why she's walking with a walker, why she can't leave this dimly lit house. But they go, we gave her some juice and some vegetables, and two weeks later, they have her vibrant outside <laughs> running down the street. She's like... I just got off of all five of my medications and I haven't used, and I'm sitting there going, what was wrong with you to begin with? (laughs) (laughs) And then he went to a heavy set guy goes, I'm on five medications. Doctor told me I'd be honest the rest of my life. Doctor even told me they might have to cut a limb off. (laughs) And then all I had to do was stop eating meat. Yeah, 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 I stopped eating meat and And he's like running down the street. Hey, I'm going to do a marathon next month. I'm like, what was wrong with you to begin with? <laughs> you never told us what was wrong with you. <laughs> this is what drives me nuts. Well, I, we, we looked into it too. Who I, was, wasn't it uh, produced by Joaquin Phoenix? Wasn't that who produced it? It was a guy who lives on marijuana. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, which, my, which is vegan. Which is vegan. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a little yeah. bit. My wife did a movie with the guy a while back. And, oh, really? Yeah, I know a little bit. Not, I don't know Joaquin by any stretch of the imagination, but... You know, I know that he's a nut. Have you ever seen that that, that where he falls off stage? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, I saw the whole. Okay, this guy's not stable. Yeah, but not, not yeah, at he all. threw a little money behind this. But the vegans, you had it right. The vegans, Sal, they first off, it was a religious group 
back in 1917. Do you guys know that? Yes, yeah, that's the, the original part origins. Of the commune. Yeah, it, it was the um, it was the uh, Seventh Day Adventists that so, started oh, this whole really? which they well, still exist in Loma Linda, California. Mm-hmm. Still like a, well, they a they're one of the biggest religions in the world, mm-hmm. right? And if it's got an ism at the end, I tell people right away yeah. that should be your red flag, yeah, right there. <laughs> so yeah. they they started this as an ideal. It only took hold about 60 years ago because what happened was no one can really be a vegan until we came up with an exogenous form of B12 because it doesn't have B12 in in the diet. So when you look at the 13 essential vitamins, there's the term essential. It means if we don't get it, we die. Die. The vegan diet does not. So every vegan will tell me, well, you can take B12. Yes, but what did you do before? Right, yeah, yeah. Years How ago? did you get that? <laughs> you yeah, couldn't obvious. be a vegan. It's true. You, I mean, in modern times, a well-planned, you know, vegan diet can be fine, but it does take a lot of planning, it and it requires modern, you know, right. modern technology and modern times. But if you go back to before, you know, the, even the agricultural revolution, like you couldn't be a vegan. You, you right. it's, it's, it would be impossible if you just lived on the. The, the vegetation that grew around you naturally, you would have starved to death besides going, having malnutrition. Yeah. Because it just, it just it doesn't work that way. But again, if you want to do it, you got to plan it out, you can do it. But this yeah. documentary in particular, total propaganda. Yeah, because they're lying to people who could use help. You know, there are people out there and you know, I'm okay with people being vegans. I'm, I'm with you, Sal. I, I'm, I'm really okay with this. What I'm not okay with is people just bold face lying about this, right? You know, well, I go on. I, well, I'm, I'm with you guys too. I we all agree on this. Is that you know, if you're doing it for moral reasons, then then by all means, I respect that. What I always try to make clear to people because there's people think it's a healthier way or a better way of living, and it, that's not. True. Oh God, no. Yeah, that's no, you're, that's you're where starting... I that's where I draw the line in the sand. Is that yes. listen, like moral reasons is more power to you if you feel good when you do it. More power to you. But don't get it twisted. It is not the best and the healthiest way for well, you to live. Studies will show, in fact, that even well-planned uh, vegans or di- uh, vegans who have well-planned diets, when they are given a substance like creatine, which is a very popular uh, fitness bodybuilding sure. supplement, they get uh, a, a pretty significant, measurable boost in IQ. This doesn't happen to omnivores because we get right. uh, enough creatine from Absolutely. meat sources. So that alone will tell you, even though they've planned everything right or whatever, uh, that they're getting a boost in IQ from taking a substance that you only get from meat. And so that tells you, that's, right. that's your clue right there. That's your big yeah. clue. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, I, look, I always say, uh, if you want to be a vegan, fall in love with avocados, fall in love with olives, because it's the only two fruit that will give you any fat. So you, And fall in love with coconuts because you can get a lot from coconuts. But the bottom line is you, you cannot – it's very difficult. As I tell – Dr. Drew gets a kick out of this every time I bring it up. Um, veganism is a convenient way to have an eating disorder and not be judged for it. Mm. You know, <laughs> oh, wow. And, and wow, that's a great that's way, way to way. put it. Yeah. But it's true. I mean you're, you're literally omitting parts of what you need to eat. And you're adding in things that are horrible for you, high grain diets. I mean, think about it. You want to talk about, you cannot eat a grain without processing a grain. I want to see anyone walk up to a stalk of corn and eat it without boiling it to death. I want to see anyone just take a stalk of of, uh, wheat and put it in their mouth. It'll destroy your gut. Oh, it will rip you a new asshole, Mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. You cannot do it. Right. You know, we got to separate the wheat from the chaff and Mm -hmm. and, and then cook that down, do everything. Mm -hmm. You... 2,000 years ago, we didn't even have wheat. Mm-hmm. Now we have, we have corn, we have wheat, we have quinoa, we have all this crap, and none of it is good for you. It just causes inflammation in your system. It can cause lots of problems. Uh, we have to process the heck out of it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it all goes back to, and it sounds like you're, you're, you're talking a lot about just eating the way we kind of evolved yeah. to eat. That seems to give us the best answers and variety. Uh, you know, periods of fasting, even periods of fasting from things like proteins. This is very controversial that we've brought up on the show in the past is that because we come from the, the fitness world, the muscle building world, protein has become this ma- this magic macronutrient. You can't get right. enough of it, eat a ton of it all the time. You need to have lots of protein all the time. Even that, if you overconsume, it can cause problems. And even being ex- exposed to it uh, all the time can cause problems. And sometimes even going low protein for a day or two 
number one, makes you more efficient at utilizing the protein when you do eat it, but it also has some health benefits. I think just that well-balanced approach seems to always be the one that seems to be best, regardless of all the fads. That- Sal, I'm glad you brought that up because, it, you know, in the bro science community, it's a little known, even less cared for situation because everybody's talking about the stuff you can buy, the powders and potions and right. pills, but it's always that bro science thing. Hey, bro, you need to have 1.5 grams of protein per pound of lean <laughs> body mass, bro. You need to have two, but, but I tell people all the time, 0. 0.06. You need that's the number we zero six point zero six. And, and the real the reason I say that's six, on the upper end too. That's the upper end. The yeah. reason I tell every every one of my clients, I say the reason I say six is because it sounds sexier than saying just take a half a gram. Right. Nobody <laughs> wants to take a half a gram, but if you say. 0.6, they go, holy shit. Oh, he measured, he knows. <laughs> and that's even high. That's a very specific number. 0.657. Yeah, six, yeah. Five, seven. yeah, yeah. yeah. do that because people will go, holy shit, Sal, Sal knows. He, met, he knows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, you, you, we brought up, you know, things to be worried about. This was a, one of the things I was talking about when I was l- talking to all these bodybuilders. It's actually become almost like a competition amongst them on who can consume the most protein. Oh, Jesus! You got guys, you got guys my size that are eating 350, 400, 500 grams of protein every day. Wow! It just it blew my mind. I thought, God, this is insane. Wow. That much protein is oh. pro-inflammatory. It is pro-aging. They've they've shown that it will accelerate the aging process. And depending on the context, in the right context, is pro-cancer. Too much protein can fuel cancer, just like sugar. Well, it yeah. turns to sugar, you know, mm-hmm. uh, gluconeogenesis. It just turns to anything past anything you can use is just converted. And mm-hmm. it's not good. That's why people, I tell people all the time, when in doubt, eat a lot of fat. You know? So mm-hmm. uh, it's obvious, Vinny, that you are on the same page as we are when it comes to nutrition and how we, t- we talk a lot about there's so much, there was better advice 20 years ago than there is now when yeah. it comes to that. Uh, we also talk about that with uh, lifting weights Ooh, and programming. Let's get into this. Um, you know, we, nowadays it, it's so popular. You open up a muscle, muscle and fiction magazine and you see these <laughs> body part splits and these guys hammering away at one body part. And you know what? A lot of these young kids that are reading these magazines, I was one of these kids that was trying to follow that is, you know, one, I'm not hopped up on that much gear Two, these guys are genetic anomalies. So I'm never going to look like these guys lifting like these guys. And what we have found with training the thousands of clients we trained that, a full body routine tends to be superior for building muscle than these these types of splits. Mainly get, because you get more frequency, more frequency of stimulation, right. and you get to focus on the important exercises. There was a period of time there where I was managing gyms in the 90s, early 2000s, where I'd be in a 40,000 square foot facility and there'd be one or two squat racks and mm-hmm. nobody would use All them. machines. Right. Yeah. Everybody was on right. the leg extension. Everybody was on the, you know, maybe the leg press. If Which like, makes no sense whatsoever. That's right. um, I, you know, I mentioned that in Fitness Confidential. You know, people say, oh, you didn't put enough about exercise. I said, no, I put everything I had to put about exercise in that book. If you, if you tell people, just do the, you know, just the average guy, do the compound movements. Right. Mm-hmm. Squats, lunges, leg press, deadlift for the legs, lower back, upper body, you know, uh, bench press, incline press if you want to, dips if you want to. And then call it a day. If, right. if you want to really girl it up, do some, some flies. But, <laughs> and then for the back, you know, pull down from over your head and then pull to you and pull up. And you're done. You know, push, pull legs, done. Uh-huh. It will give you everything you need. And now, if you want to be that bodybuilder type and you got to sit there and sit there at the goddamn curl, I can't imagine anyone doing that. I did it <laughs> for years when I was younger. And I'm like, why am I even doing it? Yeah. You know, it's not doing anything. Well, what I what I told you know, a lot of people because I went through the competing thing, and I there was I mean I was living in the gym. When you're competing at the professional level, it becomes just like a sport, you know. And it, it is. is, yeah, it consumed yeah. my life. And I said, hey, listen, if you are in there seven days a week, one hour to two hours every day, like a lot of these pros are, then I get it. While you're doing all these little tiny movements and targeting the tiny rear delt and doing all this, but for the average guy or girl who's just getting in the gym and wants to build some muscle and burn some fat, there is a way better approach yeah. than fucking around with all these little movements. I mean, like you said, overhead press, squat, dead, that's what we say, the big compound movements, sticking to those, and then the way you progress is the frequency of it. Is you know, It's not about going to failure all the time and killing it in beast mode. Right. You know, more frequent. In fact, we also even talk to people about, you know, again, I think there's this huge trend right now with the beast mode the no days off the balls to wall kill it all this 
talk that we keep trying to tell people, you know, you're probably better off going two, two reps short of failure. So you don't do so much goddamn damage. It hinders your workout for the next day. Right. You know, and getting that across versus this hammering the shit, hammering the hell out of a, a body part, not touching it for an entire week. Cause you're so damn sore. And then try, and then you wonder why you're at this plateau because your body's stuck in this recovery trap. You're absolutely right. Uh, that, that drives me nuts. The other one that drives me nuts is everybody's, Oh, CrossFit. And you know, these, <laughs> yes. um, I knew I liked you. You know, <laughs> I, I, I look at this CrossFit stuff. Number one, 99.9987. There you go. Okay. <laughs> you did, you did I, 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 I love Sal's thing <laughs> yeah. because I got to use the 87 more often. <laughs> That's um, so don't know. Can I say fuck on this? Oh, shit? yeah. Oh, don't know God. what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, yeah. please. Yeah, you know, I, I was in the gym the other day watching a guy, showing a guy how to do CrossFit, the trainer. And I know you guys must argue about this, but. The guy is doing a squat and he's all bent over and the whole thing. And the trainer is on a cell phone, you oh, know, God. You know, doing this and the whole thing. And I'm looking at it, going, "You're gonna hurt the guy. You're gonna the guy's getting hurt. He's not doing it right." And then you see him there with the ropes and beating on a fucking tractor tire and flipping the tire over. And I'm, and I'm sitting there looking at this, going, "You know, if you lift the tire up and roll it, it rolls a lot easier." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the cavemen figured that shit out. And you're trying to do it end over end. You're you taking us have... backwards. <laughs> We're not it's doing anything right here. Yeah. So I'm looking at this going, number one, you're not doing anything. You're hurting people. But let's assume you're one of the 2.758 guys yes, that okay. didn't get hurt. Then you're not doing anything because if you're constantly taking people where they're burning all of their blood glycogen, then they now have to go and eat something with sugar in it to put it back on. I, I noticed this for the first time in the 80s when Jane Fonda's aerobics came out. Uh, everybody in New Orleans, I was in school and I was CrossFit's in the lab the all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, CrossFit and Jane Fonda, Just the same identical. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> but for the first time... I'm making a t-shirt, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> women were putting on these leotards and going to these dance studios around New Orleans and I was still in college and I was still doing all these labs and my girlfriends would come to me and go, you know, I never used to have a craving for ice cream and cookies, but all I want to do is eat ice cream and cookies now. And I looked around and I went, hmm, and you never exercised before now. Hmm. That's right. And that's when I came up with the theory of you're burning up all of your glut, blood glycogen and your brain's going, feed me, bitch. <laughs> you know, what, what are you doing? So that's why I tell people, if you do zone two aerobics, if you don't take it into the red line all the time on aerobics, you can literally burn fat without worrying about burning all your blood glycogen. If you go to some morning boot camp with a, a guy driving a Hummer, I hope none of you guys drive Hummer. No, no. <laughs> because I'm looking at Justin. I was going to buy like a Hummer guy. Yeah, there is a chance he could be he driving. Could, he's he, not. He's not. <laughs> I'm talking the old style, like, you know, Schwarzenegger. The Arnold Hummer, version. The real yeah. Hummer. The yeah. Hum V. Right. And, you know, these guys show up in a Hummer. Hey, rise and shine, pussies. And right. they got these people. You're not doing anything. You're burning their sugar out. You're hurting them. You're sending them off worse than when they showed up. And that's where I draw a line. I have a problem with that. That's an interesting theory right there because I've never thought about, uh, and it, I'm sure you're familiar that there's this donut culture. Yes. And I'm sure Dunkin' Donuts Dead and every, and and every, and every and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, every donut company is loving CrossFit for this because, mm -hmm. I mean... So I, are chiropractors and physical therapists. Oh, yeah. And, right. Know. Yeah, and, and, they love CrossFit, and I and I think that that's the that's the problem is you've got a lot of these people these comp that are making a shit ton of money off this that yeah. nobody wants to say that it's a could be a bad thing you know all oh, these people are getting so fit and they're able to eat donuts. Well, I think there's also a psychological component. I think when you train, uh, when you take the average person, you train to that level of fatigue. They now psychologically believe that they earned. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes a reward to right. eat this, you know, whatever I'm going to eat now because I just beat myself up, and they don't realize that the calories in that donut equi equates to about six of those workouts, not one of them. But you see, you mentioned rewards, Al, and and that's one of the things that I always talk about. Is like, well, what do you want the reward to be? I would like the reward to be when I go on vacation, I can take my shirt off mm -hmm. and not feel like a fat slob, right? The reward shouldn't be, you know, we live in a world now where everybody wants that instantaneous reward. Amazon shows up at people's house every day. They buy shit on the internet just so something will show up. Right. We live in a society where people want it all right now. No one's willing to wait five minutes for anything, right? Mm -hmm. right? And if, if that's what you're doing, and I'm hoping someone hears these words coming out of my mouth, because 
you the reward shouldn't be, hey, I did this five minutes ago, give me a donut. The reward should be, I did this five minutes ago, I'm going to skip the donut, next month I'm going down to Santa Monica and I'm going to take my shirt off and maybe get laid. Well, what's the, what, was the, what was the study on the delayed gratification? Oh, the yeah, they've actually, they've actually done the study with children where they'll, uh, they'll present them with uh, like a treat and they'll say, you can eat this now or you can wait, and I don't remember what the time is, and you'll get two of them. And the kids have to wait a decent amount of time to get another one. And they followed these kids afterwards uh, and 10, 15, 20 years later, and they find that the ones, the kids that can actually delay gratification, far more of them become successful later on as adults. So it's actually a In scale. other aspects of their in life. In other aspects. Not just their no, not fitness the, journey. No. But every, isn't everything in life that way? When everything. You think about mm-hmm. it? Because yeah. anything that's worthwhile, you know, going to college, delayed gratification, you know, I know a lot of guys I went to high school with, they're like, screw that, man, I'm going to work. I can get a job in a plant making, at the time, $17 an hour. That's, in 1981, that was a lot of money. Screw, screw that, I'm not going to college. What was that, waste my time? But if you get a degree, you get to get out, now you have a lifetime of doors opening for you. Sure. You know, and a lot of guys, you know, and, and they go through life like that. Uh, they'll go, I want a motorcycle today when really what they want is a nice sports car. But they can afford the motorcycle today. It's the same thing as your candy, one piece mm-hmm. now or a bigger piece later. Mm-hmm. Well, you get the motorcycle and chances are you're going to get in an accident and you're going to now screw up everything else. Maybe your life, your marriage, your job, everything else because you can't walk. <laughs> you, you know, But nobody thinks about that right. in mm-hmm. the moment. It's like... Yeah. I can afford this motorcycle now versus a sports car. Mm. And, and you can look at everything in life. and Everything like that works that yeah. way. Absolutely. Vinny, I want to take you back to uh, get your business because you had said how you, you became a celebrity trainer. You wrote your book and you were going to tell us how you got online and how you do what you do now. Yeah. Um, thanks for bringing that back because it's kind of a neat story. Um, I wrote this book with Dean Laurie and... Um, Dean Laurie's with uh, William Morris Endeavor, the biggest agency in the world, right? And we took the book in there and they looked at it and we had a meeting and they said, look, this book is great. We love this book, but we have a problem. We know who Vinny is because he's been working with our clients for years. But we Googled him right before this meeting. He does not exist on Google. Like his name didn't even come up on LinkedIn or anything. Hmm. And I went, yeah, that's by design because I work with celebrities. <laughs> and the last thing you want when you work with celebrities for anybody to know your is name. Is your shit all yeah. there, right? Right, because like I'm going to name a celebrity I never, I've never worked with. Like if Britney Spears gets in trouble and you read in the paper sources close to, those sources are always a masseuse or a trainer. Oh, yeah. Period. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And very interesting. so I've always kept my list very quiet. Um but they said, you need to go online and figure out how to become famous. So I went home that night and I started looking up YouTube videos and stuff like that. And there was a girl named Jenna Marbles. I don't know if you guys oh, ever yeah, heard of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was the most famous. I literally Googled how to become famous online. You know, I put words like that into Google. And I found Jenna Marbles. And I found, uh, and she was a hot chick sitting on the edge of a bed in a bikini. And I went, okay, I'm not a hot chick. I don't have a bikini. <laughs> don't have those skills. <laughs> you know, Sal will tell you, as Italians, we do have man style bikinis oh, because yeah. it comes oh, with. He, he he's wearing a pair. He's time. wearing a pair right now yeah. with yeah. grapes yeah. on them. The Guaranteed. banana hammock. Yeah. He's yeah. all about it. We have to. <laughs> They're comfortable. They keep things where they're supposed we, to be, Adam. We feel naked with Nut huggers, them, man. is what I call them. Yeah. So, you know, I'm looking at this and then I go to another video and it's like some guys like duct taped a squirrel to a, a skateboard and pushing him down the street and it's two million hits. <laughs> You're like, this is what I have to yeah. do? And I'm like, <laughs> take that, Peter. Yeah, 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 I'm like, I can't duct tape. I, I don't even have a squirrel. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't even have a squirrel. I'm but, looking around going, yeah. I called Dean and I said, Dean, I can't become famous online. I, I don't have a skill. <laughs> I don't even have duct tape. You know, so he said, well, you need to go figure it out. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm busy over here. So I was talking to a nephew, and he said, you should do a podcast. And I said, great. What's that? <laughs> How do you do that? He goes, well, you did a radio show back in the 80s. Before I left New Orleans, I had a show called Talking Fitness, where I was taking fitness to the airwaves and doing this kind of thing before anyone was doing it. 
And it was a pretty popular show. It was more than pretty. It had really great ratings. And he said, you could do that online. And I said, well, how, do you, how, how much does that cost? And he goes, it's nothing. It's free. It's iTunes. Just, I went, well, how do you give it to iTunes? Yeah, I didn't know any of this. Hmm. And pretty much six years later, I still don't know any of this. I went to a friend who had equipment because she was a voiceover person. And I said to her, Anna Vocino, I said, Anna, can you help me do a podcast? And she said, well, you can't do one. You have to do several and you have to keep doing them. And this was the early days of podcasting. Nobody was really doing it a whole yeah. lot. Nobody was taking it seriously as, you know. So Anna and I did three a week at first. And she told me she would help me for five or six, but a month later, we're still doing them. And we didn't know what our numbers were at first. Uh, we had no way because iTunes wouldn't tell you what your numbers are. They're still terrible. Yeah. <laughs> They're yeah. still terrible at giving you a lot of the analytics. <laughs> it's really, iTunes is crazy. And so finally, someone explained to me, hook up to um, Lipson. So we went to Lipson. And this was about six months in. And the first time we looked at our numbers, we were getting, at the time, about fifty, fifty-five thousand 55,000 downloads a month. That's a lot for right out the gates. Well, especially this, six years ago. Yeah, this was like six months down the road. Hmm. And I said to Anna, I went, holy shit. She goes, what? I said, people are listening to us. And she says, yeah. I said, yeah, but our last podcast, we spent an hour coming up with every name we can think of for a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> and we got to tell them. We her, said like, this. Our, our, so one of our, familiar. One of our first episodes was Sparkly Taints. Sparkly right? Taints. <laughs> really? Uh, so you, <laughs> you guys we were gay. And we, yeah. Like, <laughs> you all kinds of random was, topics. Yeah. You guys didn't think anyone was listening, right? Yeah. No. Yeah, we, we just shoot we, it out there. Like, we, would, the, we, would, we would have some drinks and just go yeah. back and forth and just have fun. We were just having fun. Oh, wait, we could have had drinks in this podcast? Oh, shit. Well, now I know. I would have done We have to come back. We have to do it again. All right, let's do um, this. But no, we were sitting there going, gash, hatchet wound. Oh, my God. You know, we were like sitting there doing shit and, you know, bearded yo-yo. I mean, we were coming up with stuff, fur burger. You know, <laughs> fur burger. And, and we were just going through the stuff because we were pretty sure no one was listening, right? <laughs> and Anna would throw out the C word because women can say that word, uh, right? you know? And we're doing this whole thing. And I said, Anna, we have said some pretty raunchy shit. Mm. And, but we just kept doing it that way. And now Anna still does the Monday show. It's the original show. It gets crazy downloads right out of the gate. I do a Wednesday show, um, which is by my company, Pure Vitamin Club. And the Friday show is Luminaries. It's where I bring doctors in and we talk about mm. real stuff, not vegan fake stuff. And then Saturdays is a Saturday <laughs> listener call-in show. And then every other week I do a children's show on Sunday. Ah. So it's Vinny Sunday School. And we've sponsored mm -hmm. up all the shows and they do well. And here we are six years later. And the book became, when the book came out. Because now you had the internet clout through the podcast. We had some clout, yeah. As, as a matter of fact, my agent for the book uh, from Levine Greenberg, uh, Danielle Shvetkov, when we went out and gave the book to all the big book companies, well, most of them turn you down because that's what they do. And two of them, Simon & Schuster and Harper Wave, Harper Collins, came back and said, we love the book. We want to do the book. Uh, but they both wanted to give me a two-book deal. They wanted me to split my book in half and flesh out the two halves. And I said, no, I like the book like this. What's the purpose of that? Why would they do because that? Because that's a good question. I wrote part fitness book and part biography mm -hmm. and they didn't know which shelf to put it on in the single bookstore that's left in the world today Barnes and Noble <laughs> so I said really are you guys that that you know foresighted you can't you can't see what's right in front of you right and they said no we don't know which shelf it would go on so I looked around and and then they said they wanted to give me sixty thousand dollars and I said what am I supposed to do with that yeah, I have toilet paper. I can wipe my ass. I don't need this chat. <laughs> and they said, well, you, don't, you only have 60,000 followers. I said, 60,000 dollars. I said, yeah, that's probably eight or 9,000 followers. If those people buy that book, I can make more than 60,000 on my own. And then I listened to my words. And I went, wait a minute. I just thought, oh, man. Mm -hmm. I can make all the money. So I self-published. 
And it was the smartest move. And I'm telling all three of you guys, you have an audience. You have something going on. If you do a book, the stupidest thing you can do, even if, because now in my second book, I've been offered three quarters of a million dollars. I won't take it. If you can self-publish a book and you have an audience and it's a good book, that book pays dividends month after month after Evergreen. month. Evergreen. Yeah. And it never stops. It's still on Amazon. The checks come in. It's mailbox money. This is what we teach. We tell people yeah, this all great. the time that <clears throat> ask us for advice when, when getting started with a podcast was, you know, what do we, I don't know how many guides that we have. So we sell what we call like fitness guides. So we create these online programs and nutrition guides and we've created all ourselves and we sell it all ourselves. And we tell them if it wasn't for that, if we relied on sponsors, we'd be fucking broke. I mean, right. first of all, we didn't take any for the first half of the year. Then when we finally did, barely paid for the damn lease for the, the building that we're in. So, right. I mean, if you think you're going to get into podcasting and get rich off of sponsorship, you're, you're in for one. Because right. You're not going to get rich that way. Where you're going to make your money is if you actually create something yourself, whether it be programs or guides or a book. But make sure you do that shit yourself. We tell people that all the time. Yeah, you know, the book is the one thing I sell. Everything at VinnyTortoris.com is free. As a matter of fact, um, I'm putting out, it's coming out uh, next week, a 20-page uh, free PDF. Because I own the term, I own the trademark, NSNG, which has become this major brand now. You see all over the internet, NSNG, NSNG. And I own that, and people are trying to figure out what it is. So I finally wrote the tome, the piece to, and I'm giving it out for free. It will never be sold. It will always be on VinnyTotteries.com. So if anyone wants to go there, it's, it's, it's going to be free. But when is this coming out? Next week, a couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, we could probably release it in a week or two. Yeah, that, it, it will be out there. Um, and uh, finally, people can read exactly what it takes to lose weight, to be healthy, not to have a problem because up until now it's been piecemealed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like I've made enough money on the book. Um, I do Twitter for free every day. I do consults. I have to charge for that because it takes a lot of time. But between that and Amazon click-throughs and, you know, we have two or three sponsors. We have Thrive Market. Villa Capelli Olive Oil has been with us from the beginning. Uh, oh, and, man, I want olive oil to sponsor us. Oh, you got to be kidding me. You know how much olive oil I eat every great. fucking day? Yeah. <laughs> I drink it. Yeah. I, you know, Italians do that. Oh, Italians and Greeks, it. we, we yeah. just drink <laughs> it. it. Did your grandmother put it in your hair in when your you were hair. a kid? Yeah. That's why they call us greasy Italians. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you go to school and you had grease coming out of That's your head. That's where it comes from. All right. <laughs> and, yeah, and, you know, we have them. We have, uh, you know, a bone broth company that, you know. So the podcast does okay, and the click throughs and everything does. Okay, but if you try to explain that in a business school, they will say, okay, this model just does not work. Mm -hmm. But for certain people, it works if you have an audience, if you have ears. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, if you've created yourself as an authority too, if you've given a good message, you've given a lot of right. good free information. Absolutely. And then if you also, you can tell by the companies that you chose, we're sponsored by Thrive, awesome company. You know, when you've done that, there's not a lot of people which is, again, what drew me to your podcast that have done that, have stuck with their integrity, did not sell out to some supplement company that's right. pushing a bunch of propaganda and bullshit, and uh, you're providing good information for people for free. I think I think when you do that, you can make a very good living doing, doing this if you do it well. But you don't need a million followers. You need a, a, you know, a, some, a thousand or a couple thousand of, of people that you're really impacting and really helping. Right. And then you can do, you could do pretty well and... and Knowing that, I think people then don't feel like they need to sell their soul. You know yeah. what I mean? They can remain uh, true to their integrity. So, uh, looking ahead in the future, what, what's what's in the future for you? Uh, I'm hoping to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "What time is it?" Yeah, yeah. thirty you know, minutes. You're not yeah. tired from all them years at Playboy. God, I would think yeah, that would wear. Yeah, no. <laughs> that just ramped them up. You know? Yeah, you know, you know, I, I'm. I'm excited about uh, the vitamin company. Mm -hmm. We've been doing that for three years now. I literally started the vitamin company off of the book money. Um, I've always wanted to do a pure supplement that didn't have any chemicals, didn't have anything except the pure vitamins in them. And we, we were able to do that with the multi-cap. We've done it again with the uh, magnesium. We put four different types of magnesium in there. Uh, we did it. We made the first sublingual B12 on the market. We cannot find another one, anything close to it. 
that is not hooked to a sugar cube mm. is actually, it dissolves off of a piece of calcium. Oh, interesting. And uh, so we're proud of that product. And from that money, we are creating Pure Coffee Club, where I'm a big time coffee fan and have been my whole life. So we're bringing in coffees from around the world and uh, just the highest end coffees. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to sell them to people at the lowest possible price. Excellent, excellent. Very That's excellent. a pleasure, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah have dude. a great time with you, Vinny. Hundred uh, percent. We're gonna. We'll do this again for sure. I'm glad yeah. we finally got connected, man. Yeah, totally. If you ever come up in the San Jose area, come hang out with us. Yeah, we're, do, we're doing some yeah. whiskey next time. <laughs> yeah, or, or yeah. scotch. I like scotch. Oh, scotch. Okay. Shit, now I that you. I know that, yeah. God damn, we could have had that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's mid afternoon. We I can't get these guys to drink with me anymore. Just wait till you come up to Mind Pump. Yeah, I'd love to, man. Yeah, yeah. We'll have you out there for sure. Thank you, guys. Right on. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.